Hi, this is Professor Himmelblau from Bio161. Now, every week in this course, there's some things that you have to do before, during, and after lab. And here's how it works for most weeks. Before lab starts, you are going to read your lab manual to review the lab procedures and complete the pre-lab. Then once you arrive in lab, your instructor is going to give you an introduction to the concepts and techniques for that lab. Then, of course, you complete the lab activity. And then most of the effort to analyze your data and write your report with your group takes place after lab's over. So here's how things are going to be different in week two. So you will still look at your lab manual and complete the pre-lab before lab starts. But by watching this video, you're also going to get an introduction to the lab, important concepts and techniques. Then when you arrive, you'll be able to start right away. You'll complete the lab activity, and that's going to be time for you and your work group to work together to analyze the data and even get a start on writing your report. Now, to follow along with the video, it's going to be helpful for you to have your lab manual and also your lab report booklet. Remember that lab report booklet is important because you're going to have to use it to uh, find a copy of the pre-lab that's associated with this. Remember that those pre-labs get turned in at the start of lab. And also you'll have to use both of these to help yourself prepare for a possible quiz. Well, protein conformation is a really important concept in biology. And if you want to, you can think of protein conformation as the three-dimensional shape of a protein. Of course, proteins are long strings of amino acids, but what's really important about them is that they then fold up into this uh, important three-dimensional shape. And this shape is really critical for the function of the protein. whether that protein is a, an enzyme or a receptor on a cell or a motor protein that moves things inside of the cell. It's its three-dimensional shape that's really important. So the three-dimensional shape is the result of many different kinds of bonds. There's uh, covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, uh, ionic interactions, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions, and all of these work together to give the protein its three-dimensional shape. So. In lab, what we're going to do today is uh, you're going to test the ability of the protein conformation to be maintained as you change either the pH or the temperature. You'll be changing either pH or temperature, and you're going to ask this question, can the protein still maintain its conformation? Can it do its job? So to do this, you're going to be looking at a particular enzyme called peroxidase. But first, just some, some general things about enzymes. Imagine a little molecule here where we have a molecule that has these two pieces, A and B, and they're held together by a covalent bond in the middle here. And a potential reaction that could happen is that that bond could break, and then we would have just molecule A and molecule B independent of each other. Now, this particular reaction might not happen under normal conditions that you would find inside of a cell because this covalent bond between these two is really quite strong and it would be hard for enough energy to be focused on that bond for the, uh, for the two molecules to break apart. But now we can think about the role of an enzyme. So and here's I'm going to draw an enzyme. This, is, this big shape here is supposed to represent this three-dimensional conformation of this enzyme. And there's this little pocket on the side of the enzyme, which as you can see, is just the right shape to hold this molecule. Here's A and B. And this is a bit of an oversimplification, but the enzyme holds this molecule in such a way that the, the bond between A and B is stressed. And that makes it much easier to break that bond and get to our, our, our final products here. These are the products of the reaction. Okay, so just some important terms here. The thing uh, that the enzyme acts on, this is called the substrate. And this little pocket here inside the enzyme where the substrate fits in is called the active site. This is where the reaction actually takes place. And what this drawing is really designed to show is that it's the shape of this enzyme, the conformation, that really makes it able to do its job, which is to catalyze this chemical reaction. 
So now we're going to look at the actual reaction that you'll be studying in lab today. So here's the overall reaction. Now, I'm using the letter A to represent a bigger, more complicated molecule called guaiacol. And you can see uh, uh, the actual structure of guaiacol in your lab manual. But so this A molecule here is going to represent one of the substrates of this reaction, guaiacol. All right. So in one of the reactants here is guaiacol in its reduced form. This is reduced. And it reacts with hydrogen peroxide to give us the products 2H2O plus, again, guaiacol, but now it's in its oxidized state. So this is oxidized. All right, this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called peroxidase. All right, so your instructor will uh, extract some peroxidase enzyme from a turnip at the start of lab. But these two things here, the guaiacol in its reduced form and the hydrogen peroxide, these enter the active site of the peroxidase, and then this reaction is catalyzed. Now, Here's what's really important for being able to observe this reaction. In its reduced form, guaiacol is clear. It has no color. Whereas in the oxidized form, it has an amber color. So to observe the activity of the enzyme, what you're going to be watching really is the formation of this amber color from this clear reactant. All right, so now we're going to look at the setup for the reaction, and this is table one on page 19 of your lab manual. All right, so the first thing you can see is that in this uh, experiment, you're going to be changing the temperature. And it's really important that you'll leave the pH constant while you change this variable. All right, so you're actually going to need 11 tubes, and it's important to label them all before you get started. So you're going to have tubes labeled 1 through 11 at your bench. All right, now this table shows exactly what's going to be added to each of them. You'll see that there's the buffer, there's the hydrogen peroxide, one of the substrates, there's the extract, this is the, uh, the source of the enzyme, and then there's the other substrate, the guaiacol. Now, this is really important to notice the total volumes over here on this side. You should really check as you go um, to make sure that your tubes have about the right amount in them. You're going to have two tubes of the same size, for instance, here, one of them is going to be labeled tube number two, and one's going to be labeled tube number three. Tube number two should have three mils in it, and tube number three should have five mils in it. So make sure you're checking as you go to make sure that your tubes look right as far as the volume. Okay, so these are the temperatures that are going to, that are going to be held at. We'll have uh, water baths and ice baths in the lab that will allow you to maintain these temperatures. And it's really important that before you start this experiment, you have to have your... Uh, tubes incubated at these temperatures for at least 10 minutes. So, 10 minutes before you start. One thing that you can do right away, though, is this one here. The 23 degrees, that's room temperature. And so, you can do this one first. You don't have to wait because all of your reagents are already going to be at room temperature when you start. So, you can do that one first. Okay. The other thing to notice here is that in tubes 10 and 11, you're going to be using a boiled enzyme. So what you do is before you uh, get started with anything else, you're going to put a little bit of this extract into a tube and boil it for uh, five minutes. And then you're going to let it cool down to room temperature because notice when you actually do the experiment, it's going to be done at 23 degrees. So you need to boil this first and then give it time to cool so that it, you can do it at room temperature. 